Welcome to Soul Nutrition, where we discuss the various ways of nourishing our souls. I'm your host, author, speaker, and coach, Raina Rose. Today's guest, I am so excited to introduce to you today, Paul Edwards. Paul is an international best-selling author, content ghostwriter, and host of the Influencer Networking Secrets podcast. A first-generation Spanish-speaking immigrant to the U.S. with African heritage and Middle East combat experience, Paul has lived in five different countries, speaks two languages, and holds three passports. Paul does two things well, words and people. When he isn't writing content for clients, you'll most likely find him building relationships and creating opportunities for his network. Paul, it is an absolute honor to have you on the show today. Reina, so, so nice of you to have me. Thank you very much. And uh, as, as you're fond of saying, I'm, I'm really just here to work on world peace. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, um, let's just get right into it. Current events right now have been pretty tumultuous. And um, both of us have lived in several countries, speak several languages, very um, citizens of the world. How is your heart feeling right now, especially with African heritage and just tell me more about that. You know, it's so interesting you start off that way. So the, so the, the thing that I have to, um, that, the, that I've been challenged to begin to discuss is the fact of the familial line of ancestry um, on my mother's side of the family that reaches back to apartheid in South Africa. Uh, and and I would not call my family on that side uh, enforcers or uh, you know political um, advocates of it. I would simply call them people who lived and and uh, raised families in it, mm -hmm. um, experienced the transition out of it, um, all of the all of the the, the initial wonder and excitement at the notion that the South African government, the apartheid government that was in power until 1992, essentially voted themselves out of power. Yeah. Um, in order that uh, balance could be restored to that society. And, uh, you know, we now have the benefit of hindsight. And of course, if you actually bother to take a look at what has happened in South Africa ever since, it's pretty much we've exchanged one group of thugs for another. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, as I look at what's erupting over the country, I'm reminded of the much more profound truth that this is not actually a racial problem, but a spiritual problem that manifests itself along racial lines mm -hmm. and that's what makes it so impossible for us to have the conversation is we have rejected the spiritual yeah um and i know we're getting quite deep here in the very first moments of the conversation but hey we've got a little bit of time as long as we are convinced that this world is all there is and we are the top of the food chain arbiters of what stands and what falls that we are not accountable nor are we under the authority of a supreme judge which let's face it our government and our school system and our culture and our <clears throat> um, various groups all to to more or less of a degree pay lip service at best to the supreme judge mm. and he's already made clear that you honor me with your lips but your hearts are far from me and therefore you don't get to participate in my kingdom. Yeah. And so what are we, what's left to happen, but pretty much what we're looking at. Right. And we were speaking before we hit record about, you know, we pray your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven and on earth means in our lives. And if we are not, and I loved it. I wrote it down because it was so profound. I said, we have to hit record because we're having such a great conversation <laughs> before we even hit record. But you were speaking about having clarity on asking God, what should I be praying? What do I need to pray? Um, what would you have me pray, God? And listening to that rather than saying, God, do this and God, do that. And hey, God, fix this. Because a lot of times, 
we're praying for fix this, but that's not the root of the problem. That's like just chop the weed off at the top little flowers rather than uproot the weed of a spiritual depravity that, you know, until we can love God, we have to love God to love every creature God has breathed breath into. Mm -hmm. And if our hearts are far from him, they're also going to be far from each other, regardless of what differences we want to blame it on. Yes. And, and I liken it to um, trying to fix a broken down car by changing the tires. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's a good start. I mean, the, the car is not going to roll if, it, if the tires are all flat. Okay. But if the engine is completely kaput, right, and and needs to be taken apart and cleaned and reassembled and outfitted with new parts and all that, but we just keep trying to change the tires. We keep thinking, well, if we just make a law, this will go away, or if we just uh, <clears throat> establish a new set of standards for um, the way the police are to act, this will go away. We, we can't ignore, I'm not saying that, that uh, in this particular situation that what George Floyd did that elicited a police response was anything like deserving of what, he, of what ended up happening to him. But he was in the middle of committing a crime mm -hmm. when it happened. Right. He, and, and it was not the first crime he'd committed. And I know that's, nobody, nobody cares about that, right? We're in the middle of right. a a very emotional discussion. Mm -hmm. We cannot make uh, lawless people suddenly lawful by making a law against lawlessness, right? <laughs> right? You have to have an internal collective desire on the part of everyone to be, to be lawful. And uh, for the same goes, by the way, for the officer. I mean, if you look at Der Derek Chauvin, I think his name yeah, is. Yeah, his record. Uh, repeated uh, offender of, of department standards, reprimanded. Uh, the, 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 I believe it was the day after this incident occurred. I read somewhere in the news that his wife divorced him the same day. Oh, and I'm like, right. that's, a, that's way too quick of a decision. No, this was building. This guy was... This guy was a ticking time bomb. This guy, he, he wasn't doing that by accident. And I don't know if the department knew about the, the wife divorcing, but I, I saw someone say, you know, there's some professions where you just can't have bad eggs. You can't afford to have bad days, right? And, you know, had they known, I don't know if they did, about that, I, I would imagine that would be a day not to go to work. <laughs> well, yeah. Especially with that kind of record. And, and so what, what I see in both of those cases mm -hmm. and in the cases of all of the people now who are ranting and raving on social media in one direction or another is that the, we're seeing the manifestation of the spiritual bankruptcy of our age. Yeah. Um, everybody wants to have this discussion on social media. It's not a discussion you can have on social media. This is a, this is an emotional volatile discussion that needs to be had face to face. And so I refuse to discuss it on social media. Yeah. Um, it's not because part. I'm sorry, go ahead. Keep going now. It's not because I'm um, keeping silent because I, I don't have an opinion. I do. Mm -hmm. um, but I, but I don't have either one of the dominant opinions, right? Yeah. My, uh, my, my interests here are, that in all areas where um, love was not properly observed, that, that we acknowledge that it wasn't. And we say, you know, the, the more we fail to observe love as dictated to us in the Bible, mm -hmm. uh, the more we're going to get of the same old, same old. Doesn't matter how many nice little laws we make in D.C. or wherever we make them. Um, right. It's a... Bottom line, whether we're talking about spiritual completely or even just this one issue, it all comes down to a heart change to a, what the Greek would call metanoia or repentance, which now comes along with a lot of guilt and shame, but it, does, it wasn't meant to. It just means make a 180 degree turn. And 
with the racial issues, with, you know, some people being left in jobs, maybe they shouldn't be, especially that hold people's lives in the balance, with just plain, is this loving or is this not? We, we need to, as a culture, as an entire planet, have a heart change, a heart repentance that is a 180 degree turn from what's been going on. And mm -hmm. at least with people, you know, the ones who are peaceful protesting, and unfortunately, those are not the ones we see on the news, but there's been thousands of the peaceful protests with no problems at all. In those peaceful protests with people just standing up and saying, we need to make a change, um, it does go so much farther beyond this issue. But my prayer is, you know, God teach me what to pray. And may this be the catalyst for change. If we're going to have all this unrest, would it lead to enough unrest for people to change? Sometimes people need that pain point in order to make a change in their lives. And prayerfully with COVID-19 and the, you know, all this unrest around racism, people can wake up, realize we need God, realize we need to take a pause and reset, do a complete control out delete on society. <laughs> It is unfortunately the way that um, that we get brought forward beyond uh, biblical infancy. If you've read the passages where the, the, the discussion centers around um, you're still eating milk and you should be on solid food. Yes. Or the numerous passages dealing with maturity, spiritual maturity. The intent there is that you go on to become the kind of person for whom these kind of things, uh, some of them are are just out and out gone, never occur, and and then, and and sin is not absent in your life, but it becomes much more the exception than the rule, Absolutely. and you become much more thoughtful and um, and patient, so that you don't rush at things and rush to judgment and rush to. Uh, it's to, to misbehavior or whatever. Um, that's, that's the very direction we're being led. And if it's, if that's what it's going to take for a lot of people who up until this, the, the last couple of months were just, we were just zooming as fast as we could. Yeah. Um, and everybody was living high on the hog. Um, if that's what, if that's what's on order to disrupt that, to get our attention so that we, actually focus on what is on the most important thing. Um, I, I don't know that we maybe should be praying um, the, the generic prayers. I'm not saying I want to pray, please let there be destruction and violence nonstop. Right. I'm saying, please, Lord, do whatever you need to do, first of all, with me, mm -hmm. and second of all, with everyone that I love and everybody that I care about. Yeah, absolutely. And you you hit it on the head there that it begins with lord change me <laughs> because oftentimes we want to change everyone else but <laughs> mm -hmm. we, at the end of the day we still have the problems <laughs> most certainly pride is pride is atop the list of seven deadly sins it's not by accident it's not because they just said they didn't do it in alphabetical order that's for sure they did it because it's the number one yeah and it's it's so easily, it's really hard to see in yourself. You really have to have that mirror of wise counselors around you to recognize when you're falling into pridefulness because that the fine line between confidence and it's actually not that fine of a line, I think, between confidence and pride. It's more maybe the, and you speak about confidence a lot in your book. So I'd love to hear your opinion on between confidence and pride. Is it where it comes from, where, where confidence comes from a different place in the heart, where pride is coming, you know, for self and maybe confidence is coming for others? It's a great question. I want to say, Raina, that I'm, I'm probably going to miss some categories in my answer here. So there's probably people listening going to say, why didn't he t sp speak about it from this angle? And why didn't he talk about it from that angle? I'm sorry. I don't know. <laughs> I only know what's coming to me, right? Um, when I talk about confidence uh, in the context of business networking, um, 
my favorite example actually is a very well-known political figure by the name of Ronald Reagan, who's no longer with us. And President Reagan was known, I mean, if all you got to do is watch old YouTube videos of it, he was known for having this relaxed, sunny, nonchalant, um, and also very witty and, uh, and clever way of explaining his point of view and retaliating against his opponents with a smile. Right. Um, so, it, you know, as just as an example, uh, <clears throat> there's a famous press conference where Sam Donaldson stands up, this reporter from ABC stands up and says, Mr. President, in the con continuing recession, you've blamed mistakes of the past and you've blamed the Congress. Does any of the blame belong to you? And he says, yes, because for many years I was once a Democrat. Right? <laughs> <laughs> he was just, he was just clever, but he was funny. And, mm -hmm. and, 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 he, and the reason I say that I'm not trying to, people writing to me are you are, why are you so mad at the demo i'm not i'm not demonizing anybody here i'm using it as an example <laughs> um he was he was that way because he had spent decades in radio and television and movies preparing and rehearsing lines mm -hmm. over and over studying their delivery what standing in front of a mirror and delivering them watching himself deliver them on camera on tape listening to how he delivered it so that by the time he was doing that job, president of the United States, campaigning for it, holding the office, campaigning for re-election, um, it was just an ingrained habit yeah. of how he carried himself and how he presented himself. And he would carry note cards and he would memorize and practice his jokes every spare minute he got <laughs> because he understood that the easiest way to try and build rapport with people even if they didn't really agree with you all that much, was humor and and a and a and a, and he had an, a very avuncular way at his age, you know, like a kindly old uncle way of coming across to people. <laughs> That's my idea of confidence. That's doing the homework, doing the research, doing doing the fundamentals produces mm -hmm. confidence. Arrogance and egotism is thinking you know it all and you don't have to. Right. It's, it's the opposite of being prepared, really. It's, I'm not prepared, it, so I'm going to overpride it and pretend that I am. Staggeringly unprepared. Mm -hmm. and, and, and how do I know that? Because I've made the mistake so many times right. um, of not doing the homework. And, 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 you know, I used to have school teachers. Um, they would actually tell me. I had one of them. I had a Spanish teacher. I was really good with languages, right? I could pick up languages really well. Mm -hmm. And uh, I never studied. And I just, I could, I knew the answers to a lot of the tests. I would always get at least a B or an A. Yeah. So I'd sit there in class and just goof off. And she dragged me out in the hall one day and she's like, you know, you have such a gift with the language. I'll give you that. But you're, an, you're arrogant and cocky. And I'd never had anybody tell me that before. And I didn't know what she was talking about. But all you had to do was go to another one of my classes where I didn't have a natural aptitude and her proved her point exactly. Ah. Uh -huh. And also in hindsight, you know, I can see like, boy, I really, if I had wanted to apply myself in that environment, the way I apply myself to my work and um, to what I do now, mm -hmm. whew, boy, uh, I could have steered my life in a much different direction than I did as a young man. I did the same thing. I, I came from, you know, a British education system in Borneo and um I kind of, I did the opposite though. I, I didn't know all the answers. I, I was spelling, you know, color with a U when I first came back and I was doing the math all wrong. And, and so had I had the knowledge I have now as a little kid, I would have told those teachers, you need to le learn English, not me. <laughs> you know, you're speaking mm -hmm. American by uh, spelling color without a U and um, the ways I was doing my math wasn't right. And just constantly I was doing what I had once been taught, but it is no longer correct. Um, yes. And I, I honestly nearly failed out of elementary school, but once I caught on, I was just such a better problem solver. I could uh, flexibly go from one system to another and see the problems because, because of the challenge. But it first just like knocked me completely off of how to learn anything. And I totally gave up on school. And so 
learning how to be prepared. I would like be in my history teacher's class at lunch every single day, just doing the homework, making sure I had everything done, knowing the right answers. Now that came from feeling really stupid because I'm switching school systems, you know, mm -hmm. to learn how to be extra prepared. Because in the other school system, I could just, you know, oh, get by yeah. without too much preparation. But it's good to be thrown into these challenges, kind of like we are in this current environment that forces us to do something different, forces us to come up with new solutions to our problems. Which, uh, you didn't ask me this, but I'll just volunteer, is the origin of my book. Um, yes, and, I, and that's an I, entrepreneur's job, right, is to solve problems. Yes, but you know, I think there's a temptation to think solve problems means uh, figure out how to make um, XYZ widget work. And that's, right. that can be, that can be the problem. But um, I think more, quite, quite a bit more often the problem is you. Right. <laughs> you got to <laughs> yeah. figure out how to make your, you know, I've had this discussion with so many people recently. It's starting to become a thread that, that shows up everywhere. It's entrepreneurship is about becoming an entirely different version of yourself. Yeah. It is a, it is a extremely spiritual exercise. Um, Absolutely. And you talk about um, the five qualities of a generous entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that to learn to be generous is, is a lifelong lesson that God teaches us. Could you tell us a little bit more about those five qualities of the, um, what is it, the, the radically generous entrepreneur? Yeah, radically generous. I love that. Well, I was... Uh struggling in the insurance business um if you've seen the movie groundhog day it's it's an over-the-top caricature but it's actually not far from the truth um if you're an insurance salesman you're selling a product people don't understand don't really want to know about um in fact if they've had negative experiences they hate it they've heard the stories there's plenty of and 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 the more you, it, it, in a way, it's almost like um, <clears throat> the more you discover about it, the more you, the more confused you get. Oh. Um, there's, there really is no wrapping your head around it. Uh, even professionals I know inside insurance companies who are underwriters and risk managers and attorneys and all that, they say there's just, there's no end to it. Um, so I was, I was in this um, position where I had, my first job was just dialing for dollars and setting appointments. But the second job I took, uh, my branch manager, um, gentleman by the name of Abron Harris told me, um, I don't want to see you in this office most of the time. He said, if you're, if you're here, it's, it's because you're closing business, taking money, signing forms. I want you should be out of here eighty five percent of the time. That was his philosophy, and I didn't understand at the time what a gift he'd given me by telling me that because I was totally used to being confined to the office. But off I went. Um, I knew nothing about networking. Um, I knew nothing about even where to go. I just started googling places, you know. And I started going to these places and at first I was just kind of quiet observing, watching, you know, my military experience kicked in and I'm like, don't, you know, don't just rush in and, and all that. But after a while you get talking to people and I was very much in the military mindset of go out and kill something. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so figuratively speaking, not literally, but right. I would go, I would go and I would try and start, start the conversation about insurance. And I got so much, so little uh, reciprocity from it. And so much, uh, I, I know I'll just back away, you know, or never speak to me again in some cases. I got so much of that. And I was like, I'm not going to sell anything at all doing this. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, I had to sell. I had, it's like, I got to figure out to, how to sell something, you know. Yeah. Because nobody wants to be sold, but everyone wants to buy, right? Well, see, the thing is, they do want to buy, but but in this context, what is it they're buying? That's the right. question. Mm -hmm. 
they don't give a rip about the, the insurance policy as long as it's enough to cover them when something happens, right? They, in other words, you know, that we have in an in auto insurance, you have what you call state minimums, right? And, and nobody wants to buy that coverage unless you, that's all you can afford. Yeah. Um, so I was like, so the question to me became, well, what are they buying? And the very first time that this occurred to me was um, they had a, a thing in 2013, maybe 14, where a law had passed in Congress that was going to um, defund the federal coverage of flood zone insurance in noted, you know, class A flood zones where it's guaranteed you're going to get your home's going to get flooded every year. Right. But we have a couple of those near where I live. And so I thought it would be a good idea just to bring it up to the local realtors um, association where I had been networking. And I did that. And, and that same day, I had people, five or six people come up to me afterwards and start, you know, saying, that was really helpful. Thank you. And I got, you know, that was, those are kind of those open invitations. Hey, I'd like to get to know you better. Right. Yeah. And I, f I quickly realized something in my bet from reading Dale Carnegie years ago is that I gave them information that's useful to them, not me. Yes. But I gave it as an expert being, because it's about insurance and I'm an insurance agent. I gave them useful information, useful to them about something that I understand. Yeah. So I said to myself, okay, well, I can't go to every context and do that, but I can take the principle and this is a bit of a long way, long winded way of answering your question. I'm aware of that. <laughs> um, I said, I can take the principle and I can start talking to a lot more audiences about some very conventional topics that no matter what group I'm in front of, if it's entrepreneurs anyway, if it's business people, salespeople, marketers, they're all going to want to know it. Yeah. And um, probably about a year later or so, a mentor of mine was sitting there watching me. He thought I was a really good networker, um, told me so many times. And then he said to me one day, he said, why don't you teach a seminar on networking itself? And I had, uh, I, the thought had never occurred to me, but when I sat down to think about it, I said, you know, I probably could do that. I probably could put together a simple, you know, little PowerPoint, couple bullets and just talk for 15 or 20 minutes. And so some of the stuff that you read in the book today, in fact, that, that is still making it into the third version of my book, um, I'm still using. And I still use the same terms that I used in that original presentation I gave. Yeah. Um, and so that, that's where these five qualities came from, as I realized over and over again throughout the entire time from then on as an insurance agent and through to today as a ghostwriter, I use some or all of those principles with all of the business relationships I cultivate. Absolutely. And I know you talk about like the, the five tips for networking with dream connections. Can you explain what that is for our audience? Well, that what, what happens if you do this enough, right? It, it, it's like anything else. If you um, go and practice a sport like tennis long enough, the right way, uh, eventually you can't play in the, in the, the baby leagues anymore. Right. Um, and, and what I found was I was networking at a very basic level and that, that started to get stale. Yeah. But, but what also happened was I had solidified some relationships there and, and had joined some nonprofit boards where, all of a sudden I had to find some higher stakes opportunities. And um, I started getting invited to things that none of my competitors even knew about, never got in their mind, got invited to. Amazing. And I was like, what's going on here? And so um, I, I realized that if you do the business of personal relationships faithfully, right? He who is faithful in small things can also be trusted with big things. If you do the business of, of networking through relationships faithfully for the average person you, you meet long enough, pretty soon you'll be doing it in front of the not so average person you meet. <laughs> yeah. 
And, uh, but then of course the question is, well, what are you going to do when you're in front of that person? And my, I, I take you in a sort of a circular path to say, if you do this, if you practice these four things on this person, mm -hmm. these, these people that you see every day, when you get in front of that, that whale, um, who has the power to elevate you in business, uh, you'll get a, you'll get a chance. You'll, you'll know what to do. You won't need to. So to answer the question to, to people are listening, so what are these tips? Okay. Yeah. The first one, <laughs> the first one is focus on the farm <laughs> team. <laughs> but make sure you read the book too. I'm because I, there's so much in here and I've, I'm just in the beginning and I've already been highlighting and taking notes and it's, there's so much more than these five tips or the other. I really encourage you go out and, um, and buy this, this, uh, this book. It's so good. It's the, the influencer networking, uh, secrets book as well, right? Yes. We, it's, it's not available just yet, but if you go to my website, we'll give the URL in your show notes and all that, I'm sure, but, uh, you can go there and uh, get on the list. We're going to be doing some advanced copies in September. So that's why I'm starting to get out there and talk about it now. Excellent. So, so you asked, <laughs> you asked what the tips were. So, um, I've put focus on the farm team as number one and focus on the farm team is just a cute way of saying, do this for everybody, right? Do this for people you meet at the local chamber luncheon, do this for people you meet through the rotary club, do this for people in your neighborhood. Then I say, okay, now here's the how, right? And, um, you start with, it, I, I call it being, there's a couple of ways I've phrased this. Um, th my latest favorite way of saying it is become a scout, uh, become a publicist and become a counselor. And so a scout is, uh, you'll read the principle there, keep your ear to the ground. And you're basically starting to keep your ears up, your radar up for opportunities, people, um, connections, uh, clients, you know, prospects and all that for other people instead of yourself. Yeah, that's, you know, that, that has been such a change maker in my own life. I completely agree with you on that one. So, um, uh, you know, I'm trying to think of a, of a real time example here, but you, um, you can do this with client opportunities. You can also do it with events. You can do it with, as, as you and I have been doing with, uh, with opportunities to appear on shows, mm -hmm. right? Um, it, it's another version of uh, chapter three, which is pro bono publicity, right? This is, you're basically um, making opportunities for other people you know in business to get more opportunities, whatever yeah. they may be. Um, so that's the scout, the, um, and that's the keep your ear to the ground. Um, the next one is, um, be an angler. And, uh, I recently wrote a blog about this. Um, and will that and be on that same link if we want to go check out that blog? I will have the blog on my website. Uh, so yeah, there's a section there. You'll be able to see it. Um, I, I borrowed this term from fly fishing, which I've actually never done. <laughs> um, but what I understand about fly fishing is if a good fly fisherman casts the, the rod with the bait on it, and he's able to make it look like the, the bait, which is usually an insect, is flying across the surface of the water, and the fish look up and they see it, and they say, oh, lunch, right? <laughs> and that's quite a skill. Well, the, the analogy that I'm using there is you need to go to a networking function, but you can't go there for the same reasons that everybody else is there. Right. Mm -hmm. So you go there to do business, but you can go there for business reasons. And that makes all the difference because that takes the pressure off of selling, right? You don't have to say buy insurance or buy whatever, whatever I'm selling. Um, but you can go there for business reasons, right? Meet people, learn things, find out about opportunities, right? See what this is all about. I'm curious, I'm new, I, you know, yeah. any number of those things. And again, like you mentioned in the scouting for other people's opportunities, you know, who can I be of service to here? Who can I connect here? And ultimately that service leads to fruitful business in your own life too. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I like to say I, I do stuff for free and I send God the bill. <laughs> I love that. 
And you are a super connector. Um, I'm thankful already to be in your network. And so someone who can become like you have made yourself that people recognize you as someone who's a super connector. I want to be part of his network. Um, then people want to do business with you because they just want to be part of what you're all about, what you're doing. And we discussed a little bit before the show, I was talking about how I sometimes relate the way that we can do Christianity to your early attempts at insurance sales, you know, where it was all about trying to tell people about what you're doing and what you are trying to sell them. And we can get caught up in that in our Christian walk too, where we're trying to kind of sell Jesus and mm -hmm. sell some heavenly life insurance, you know, and instead of people wanting to get caught up in this beautiful, you know, kingdom living that we are experiencing. Yeah. And that's what I see in you. Like you have this amazing energy and you are such a giver and people just want to be part of what you're doing, whatever that might be. I'm grateful. I am. Um, I'm honored. I, I only wish it had been that way much longer in my life than it was. Um, and I, if I get any credit at all, it's only for having chosen to listen a little bit more than, than I previously did. And you'd be amazed what it took to get me to do that. But there it is. <laughs> and, and, you know, that's encouragement that we can choose to listen at any age. We can mm -hmm. choose to listen now. And God will restore to us the years the locusts had eaten, even if we were our own locusts. Oh, you have no idea. <laughs> oh, I do. But you I probably do. <laughs> <laughs> I sure do. I, I've been an entrepreneur since 19, so I definitely um, have had to learn this lesson time and time again. Sometimes I pray, God, please don't make me walk around the mountain for 40 years. <laughs> and help me just mm -hmm. enter right into that promised land. And, and like you said, it's that listening. Just like we talked about in the beginning of the show, God, what would you have me pray? What would mm -hmm. you have me talk about today? What would you have me? And that's what we do before every show is, you know, Holy Spirit, lead this conversation. Um, yeah. If we would only enter business this way, and I know for like, at least for my personal clients, I always take at least a half hour and just praying for them that God would speak through me, not me leading them, you know? And so, yeah, that, I, that encouragement that you were saying, just to listen mm -hmm. and listen now, don't wait another 10 years, another 20 years, whatever it might be for people. And for us, today, if you, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. No. Mm -hmm. Amen. And so did, how many did we get so far? We had to be a scout. Be, um, that was a Salah moment there. We were, we were just, uh, I know we were, I was like marinating and then I'm like, we oh, just, yeah, we right. needed to ring a bell or something. So everybody, yeah. <laughs> Um, so done for you publicity is the next one. So we've covered being angler, you know, um, and that's, again, that just goes back to you're there, but you're not there for the reason that anybody else is there. Yeah. Um, and even that desperation that you feel at networking events, you know, that uh -huh. I need to sell you something, you have to do business. It's just, Oh, you know, I'm here. If I'm I can to, help you, great. I'm here to serve. Yeah. I'm here to serve. Yeah. And yeah. isn't that what Jesus calls us to do? That's that upside down kingdom world that doesn't make sense until it does. Correct. Yeah. So sorry, be an angler and then the um, pro bono publicity is for. Done, done for you publicity. For you. Um, I make a subtle distinction there. There, Again, there's some overlap with the pro bono publicity concept. But basically, um, I have a friend, John Corcoran, who used to write speeches for President Clinton. And he's a, he's a big networker too. And a while back, he posted this. And I loved what he posted because I suddenly realized, never having read it, that it was exactly what I did for um, some of the most powerful relationships I've built. Um, so, you know, he, he talks about just some very practical things and it boils down to becoming a good customer of the person you want to have a relationship with. Mm. Um, so, so buy their stuff, right? Buy their courses, read their books, promote it on social media, go to their conferences and events, ask for an interview. Uh, you know, send them a sincere handwritten note, look for mute friends you have in common with them and build toward that relationship. Um, 
and and you know i've i've got very practical examples but just as a as a recent one um you know i uh i had john eldridge on the podcast uh a few months back um and he's got this new book out and i i detail it in the book i say look um I'm not saying that I suddenly presented John with an offer he couldn't refuse. He was in the market to be on podcasts anyway. You know, let's be honest about that. However, he gets a proposal to appear on a podcast. Number one, this guy is a Ransomed Heart Bootcamp alumnus who is a, who's been supporting the organization for years, who has interviewed two of his closest guys that work there at Ransomed Heart and several other uh, recognizable names in the kingdom. Um, he's read every book you've ever written. He can speak fluent, ransomed heart ease. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, and he's a personal success story, a, a personal living, breathing testimonial to everything that you've tried to. I mean, it's. Th does that sound like you would? Would you look at an opportunity like that, Raina, if if it was all geared to what would you do and say, no, nah, I don't really want to be on a on a podcast like that. Right. No, of course you would want to be on that. Yeah, you, you, you build a case, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and very often the way this happens is by building relationships with the person closest to that person. Because you can't mm -hmm. go directly to someone who's got, you know, all these accolades and pedigrees and all these people wanting their attention. No, you got to come in through the back door. Right. And, They're going to um, have gatekeepers to get to that front door anyway. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So done for you publicity. Uh, and then, of course, the other thing is... Um, if none of those other things work, uh, if I suddenly found myself in a situation where I had 10 minutes to have a conversation with a, with a very influential person, right? We're sharing a taxi cab or something or an, or an Uber. Um, there's always three questions that I found. I got these, I stole these from Vince Del Monte, who also stole them from somebody else. So I, I don't know who, from you. <laughs> you may steal them from me. I, I give you full permission. Um, uh, in networking, people always say, hey, how's it going? And you're like, uh, you don't care. <laughs> you know, it, the long, it, if you do it enough times, you, you start to realize who's asking that question just because that's what everybody does and who actually means it, right? Yeah. And I said, I don't want to be that guy. I, I don't want to be the guy who just says, hey, how's it going? And then moves on. Mm -hmm. right? So what so you I mean, talk about, right? Generally. But, yeah, but, but I don't want to be rude either and ignore people and pretend like they don't exist. So I'm not going to, I'm, I'm going to smile. I'm, you know, if someone walks up, I'm going to, I'll, I'll do the usual pleasantries, but the, 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 one of the, I have these three questions and usually the first one is the one that gets out of my, out of my mouth the earliest. And that's is what's going well for you lately. Mm, I like that. You're starting them off on to get them thinking, okay, most recent uh, thing that made me smile, right? Yeah. Our mutual friend, Adam Connors, he, had his, he, he has his own version of this. He says, what, what is the thing you've laughed at the hardest recently? <laughs> brilliant question. Yeah. Absolutely brilliant. He asked it to me, and, <laughs> and I, had, I had to think about it for a second, but what I did, I, I, started, I started belly laughing on the podcast. And <laughs> so, You're like, you made me laugh the hardest lately. Yeah. So, um. Brilliant question. Uh, so, so what's going well for you lately? Second one is what's not going so well for you lately? Mm. Now, now have something to write with if you can't remember this because this is gold, right? People are going to tell you, oh, God, I get employee problems. I'm pulling my hair out trying to deal with this issue. I, I, I can't get enough customers in the door, you know, to get all kinds of stuff. That, or they'll tell you personal stuff, right? Doesn't yeah. matter. Doesn't matter. Listen and make mental notes of it. And, um, and most of the time, the bigger your mental Rolodex gets of people you know, um, the sooner you can offer them an answer to that problem or, or something to, to help relieve that pain. Right. You can say, I, and I just, I just watch people's shoulders kind of lighten up a little bit. I say, I may know someone who can help you with that. And they know that I mean it, right? right. They know I'm, I'm not just blowing smoke. They know, no, this... This, I know this guy. I know how many people he knows. He probably does someone know someone who could help me. And you really and, do. You wouldn't say it if you didn't. It's, it's the very words I live by is who I know and who knows me. Mm -hmm. 
So, and then the last one, you know, this one, um, if you get past those other two, and um, then there's, you can always add in, well, what are you looking forward to lately? You know, because people love to talk about, well, I got vacations or trips coming up or, you know, I've got this business deal I'm working on and it's looking really good and et cetera, et cetera. And that's just a way of getting them back on the positive. But it's also, and this is also what I, these three questions I say are, are, are an introvert's best friend for, for, for networking because you don't really have to say much beyond the three questions. If you, you get somebody talking, they'll, they'll talk for quite a while. Yeah. And I mean, even I consider myself a very social introvert in the definition of, I want to have deep conversations with a few people. Um, mm -hmm. I have actually, especially as I'm sure you traveled around the world, you have many of those few people in different places, but I feel like as an introvert, we, low the, the small talk right we just want to really know who somebody is and then you know if I can really know a hundred people truly then I'll know a hundred people but I want to really know who you are what is going on in the depths of your heart not just how you doing how's the weather where you live you know mm -hmm. yeah and that all takes time mm -hmm. and it can't be done in just one conversation either yeah but those three questions help you deep dive pretty quick into you know what makes you smile? What's truly on your heart? And what do you look forward to? I mean, you, you're coming in past, present, future. We're really bringing that almost like that God time into things because it's, it's all past, present, future in one conversation. Exactly. And that's, and, and people, you see, um, we have the present moment, but the past is always with us and the future is, you know, God willing, it's coming. Here's Siri trying to interrupt our call. <laughs> Um, so you have those, those categories and you need to be mindful of them. Um, but yes, yeah, that's a, that's an excellent point. I hadn't thought of it that way, but yes, uh, it gives you a, a, a very godly way of looking at the whole person. And, uh, and sadly the culture has encouraged us for decades now to simplify the answer to that question into one word. If we can, oh, I'm fine. Mm -hmm. Sorry, that's not good enough. I, I, I don't buy it for one thing. And I'm sick and tired of saying it for another. Oh, yeah. I Actually, to be honest with you, even when I was a teenager in high school, and I remember when we learned our, you know, memory verse of James 1, 2 through 3 about developing perseverance, you know, through trials of many kinds. And so when I was having a pretty rough day and my friends would ask me how I'm doing, I'd say, I'm developing perseverance. <laughs> and that was just my keyword for saying, it's a bad day. You know, <laughs> like, things are not. I'm having trials of many kinds. <laughs> And, yeah. you know, at 17, those trials of many kinds could be, you know, your skirt didn't fit today to, you know, <laughs> something else. It is actually. what it is. <laughs> it's, I, you know, I, I remember what bothered me when I was that age and it doesn't bother me now, that's but right. don't begrudge the people that it does, you know, that that's just their level of maturity. And now, of course, if they're still worried about that at 47, the way they were at 17, there may be some maturity issues we need to work on there. Yeah. So I'm not and I think as a society, as we talked about in the beginning of the show, we do have maturity issues as, as an entire culture of the world. I mean, both of you and I, having traveled the, you know, most of the entire world, um, I'd say that our whole world, including myself, and I'm sure you at times, we have maturity issues and we do need to go from that milk to the meat, um, mm -hmm. both spiritually and as we do it spiritually, it will manifest in all other areas. I wanted to bring up one part of your book. I don't want to miss this because I would, like I said, I'm only in the beginning and I'm already highlighting and taking notes and writing things down. And um, so I encourage everybody, make sure we can get that website on the screen here. Go check it out. Sign up for the mailing list so that you can get the first copies that come out of this book. I feel so privileged to be able to have it already. And so you were mentioning about those radically generous entrepreneurs. And um, this part just really touched my heart. It said, radically generous entrepreneurs execute on a diligent, thorough schedule. They're thoughtful before, during, and after the working day. They aren't rushing to try to capture as much of the market as they can. They see work as an important component of life, but not the be all and end all. They reject the rampant workaholism of the Western entrepreneur class and they break with our deep-seated cultural agreements that success is entirely up to us and that we're therefore weak 
or defective because it isn't happening right away. Mm. Wow. So mm. powerful to anyone who has ever run a business or even tried to run a business or tried to sell anything, just tried to be successful about anything. Mm. And I just love that part about, you know, that we think it's entirely up to us. And again, that comes back to what we we're talking about earlier. God, what would you have me pray? Um, because it's not and, up to us. And and what is you know? I know you're supposed to be asking the questions here, but yeah. but what is when when you read that? What do you think back to in your own experience that maybe helps you see it a little bit clearer or uh, helps you understand? I, I put too much on my shoulders at one point. Oh, I mean, I have a constant tendency to do so. So again, I, I started my first business when I was 19 and I'm very, you know, um, ambitious and I'm going to do it all. And I had wonderful, though, spiritual teachers from that age that when I would, you know, business would be not as, uh, my business was in fitness. And so it was pretty cyclical for the seasons. And I would be all upset, you know, business is slow. What should I do? And my mentors would say, I think you should enjoy the slow season. The busy season mm. will come again. And I think you should just be and enjoy this time with God and uh, not try to get people to come in, you know, during Christmas time to uh, be a fitness client of yours. You know, <laughs> like, like times when it's just not going to be productive anyway, that's not a good use of your time. Why don't you enjoy some rest? And other times where, um, you know, I've had opportunities given to me that were said, you know, I'd have to have 10 years of experience, so many thousands of dollars, which I had neither at the time. And I rested into being in the right place at the right times and doing the right things and fully showing up to what I was doing. But nothing I did could have gotten me 10 years of experience and the thousands of dollars I didn't have. Like God opened the way for that. And so this combination of like, I wasn't trying to squeeze every bit out of my own ability. Mm -hmm. And I, that, well, that's what, when I read that, it was like so much of our culture says hustle, 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 hustle at all costs. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to be diligent, do the work, form the relationships, and then like breathe, allow space for God to move. Because what is not within your control cannot be changed into being within your control. I, absolutely. And I remember that, um, see, the insurance industry is terrible for this. They, they say, you got to sell this amount of life insurance policies or we're not going to pay you anything, right? And uh, <laughs> 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 it, they pulled it on me so many times. And um, a mentor of mine one day said to me, you know, I never, I, I've stopped writing the goals of number of policies I want to sell. And I said, why? And he said, because it's not in my control. He said, I could, do, I could do the absolute best job of being a persuasive and thorough and sincere and honest salesperson as I want to. At the end of the day, I cannot make another person say, I will spend my money with this person. I can give them every reason to, and I can, and I can leave them with no reasons not to, but they still reserve the right to say no. Mm-hmm. So I, if, if I'm going to set a goal, I'm going to set a goal where the only person who is the determining factor on whether or not that actually happens is me. Oh, I love that. And uh, so, you know, I knew by that time, I said, I think I could run with that because I knew, okay, I know if I go to networking groups consistently, I'll get business. I know if I go do trade shows consistently, I'll get business. I know if I go and do public speaking, I'll get business. I know if I go and serve on nonprofit boards, I'll get business. So I said, I started setting goals saying, I'm going to go to this many networking events and I'm going to speak at this, you know, at this function and I'm going to participate in that trade show and I'm going to send X amount of handwritten notes every, every week. And I never really had to worry about it after that. No one ever grilled me about your numbers are terrible. And my numbers were always, they were never super high but they were decent. They were always mm -hmm. enough that made it worth keeping me on, kept my, you know, kept me earning an income and all that. And, uh, you know, I, I, w I really wanted to, since I felt like I was stuck there, stuck quote unquote in the insurance business that, um, that I really 
you know, really wanted to be excellent and become a, a, a top seller there. But it didn't happen because it was it was a um, it was a it was sort of a, a side trek to teach me a skill that I would not have picked up otherwise. Hmm. I I love how God does that. Well, because w would we choose it, right? Right. Exactly. <laughs> of course not. You know. And so, um, so I never got to the, the kind of numbers I wanted to, but I definitely built this. Um, personal brand that you know i would walk into rooms and I, people would come running up to me and i had no idea who they were and they would i love your facebook videos those are just the coolest thing in the world and i do these little like selfie videos just you know babbling about something but <laughs> um and i'm like that's great and and you are you know <laughs> and um and it that was what i took with me when i left the insurance business and i started writing books and and you know, studying influence and all that. As I said, I built all this influence and I had all this clout and I could m make things move and happen for people and connect people. And it's like, there's gotta be something to this. Yeah. And lo and behold, there was. Right. And now you're able to, you have polished that skill to where it, now that you have those dream network clients, it, you are natural with anyone because everyone's, you know, you're there to serve, you're there to learn, and and people bring you into their circles for that reason. Yes, and to your to your emphasis there on what I wrote, um, I'm also not rushed. Mm -hmm. I'm like, um, I'm here to serve, and if it makes sense, if it's a good fit, great. Would love to have you as a client. Yeah. If it doesn't make sense, um, we can still be friends. <laughs> you know, doesn't have to doesn't have to work out. I'm not like uh, you know. And sometimes um, it's not that person that it's meant to work out with anyway. It's someone that person introduces you to, or or something. I um, I give that example with a job that that job that I uh, didn't have the ten years of experience for and all that. I had actually moved to that area to start an aviation business with a former colleague of mine and mm -hmm. I thought oh we're gonna do this business this is how it's gonna go and God was just like yeah I couldn't get you out to Houston if I didn't you know lure you in with that business but that's not what I have for you <laughs> yeah he's clever he is he is and so yeah and so I I love that part of the book I love the idea of not being rushed I think so often we do, we have those goals that are, we don't even have control over anyway. Uh, I love the idea of making goals that you have complete control over, not being rushed. What advice would you give to someone? I mean, for me, I'm always telling people that, that are like clients with me to, especially if they're not doing what they want to do yet, to be able to save, I saved several years of income so I could kind of not be in that desperate position of, I need to make this happen right now. What yeah. about someone who hasn't maybe saved that or done that? What, how do you encourage them to calm down and not be in such a rush, even though it seems like they need whatever it is right now? Well, there was, uh, there was some good advice given to me by a mentor of mine when I started to contemplate leaving the insurance business. And I said to him at the time, I, I don't really know that I can even make a living off of my talent. No one's ever volunteered to pay me for it. They don't have jobs around here for it. I could maybe get something in Seattle or Portland, which are the two nearest major markets, but you know that implies moving because I live too far, just far enough from either one of them that it means a, a ferocious commuting lifestyle that's going to basically take out my family yeah and um i'm looking at this this guy he's good uh probably 30 years older than me and uh you know he he's one of these these old men that has these these eyes right and you read so much in them um and he just looked at me and he said uh yeah you're right you don't you, you don't um you don't have the prospects 
And I said, what, so what do I do? And he said, you prepare. Hmm. He said, you show up at your job because you got to fund your lifestyle, right? You've got to pay for feed your family and all that. And he said, then when you have 30 minutes here, 60 minutes there, you know, stay up a little late, get up a little early, um, prepare, practice, right? It's like Reagan. Preparation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, he didn't need to tell me to build connections cause he knew I already built them. Right. Uh, um, but there's the side, of course, that you can be great at building connections, still not have a marketable offer for people. And I had that I, up until the beginning of this year, as a matter of fact, all the way through the end of 2019, I was trying to make get people to buy a product. I didn't know what it was. <laughs> Which um, is easy to do when you first get started in any business. <laughs> well, you know, that's the thing is um, you need to be very clear when you show when you walk into a room how do you serve humanity mm. uh, rabbi lapin who you're going to meet has that has, that's his that's his way of asking the question and it's a very different way of saying what do you do right i love that i, how I do you, feel like i want to ask that now instead of what do you do how do you serve humanity well so do i it's a, it's a habit i have to get into and um <laughs> And I, uh, so much of my networking now is through podcasting. So I, I don't usually find myself having to ask the question because most people come on the show and I already know, right? But, right. You've done your research. <laughs> and so yeah. I know I, I like to know the answers to the questions before I ask <laughs> as well. Yeah. Um, just before we leave, we, we kind of did hit on that, you know, if you're getting those no's or you, um, persevering and how to get to that yes I think you kind of answered it in that question um, but I wanted to talk to you You hit a little bit on family mm -hmm. and especially right now while people are starting to work from home and the borders between home and work are starting to be blurred how does one make sure that they have as perfect as possible of a balance between you know giving your work life and how you're funding your family as much energy as you can as well as really being present and home and disconnecting per se in from that work life to be fully present with your family that's a good question and i i would only answer it first by saying that i'm closer to understanding it than i used to be but quite a ways away from where i think i'd like to be um and probably the uh, the number one thing again goes back to having that monastic um heart that i describe in chapter two mm -hmm. and and we're just going to apply the principle here is a benevolent detachment from your work mm -hmm. right when you're when you're working you're working and when you're not you trust god that you know he's going to take care of you um, I always ask people that question when they come to me with the anxiety. I say, well, does your father care about you or does he not? Yeah. It's just a simple answer, right? It may not necessarily look like it right in the moment, but th th that answer hasn't changed. Does God, and I, and I can ask myself that question. I've trained myself to ask that question. Can I trust the father to get up from my computer, walk away and go walk around the neighborhood with my wife? Yeah. Or go take my son. He's learning to rollerblade and just walk around and as he learns to rollerblade. And of course the answer to that question is yes. Mm -hmm. um, if you know the answer to that question, then you know that if you've put in, you know, a good solid work, week's worth of work and it's not quite where you want it to be, there's stuff left undone, et cetera, et cetera. You know what? all else being equal, it's still going to be there on Monday. Yeah. Um, and it's still going to be there as long as the company has the money to pay you or you, if you're a business owner, then as long as you're earning an income and, and all that, it's not going away. And if you're exhausted and trying to make it perfect, you may be making it less and less perfect. Yes. And more you to make it perfect. It, I think the expression is perfect is the enemy of the good. Yes, and more is not necessarily better. That's right. I, I used to work with someone 
that like God love them. They were always trying to make things perfect, but sometimes they'd stay up all night long and then actually just make this ball of twine that took unraveling for the next week. <laughs> yes. And so can we trust God? And also how much, why do I want to trust myself in this, this part of this fatigue that I'm putting myself into? God is much more trustworthy than I am and he can work miracles well, I'm not, of course we put in the work, but I think some people use it as an excuse to not do any work, but when we're doing the part we should, we can trust God to do the rest. So what was the expression you gave us about um, making the deposits? Sorry, which one, the making the... I think you said something about like, you do something and then God does the rest. I... Oh yeah, I, I, I give generously up front and I send God the bill. The bill, yes, I send God the bill. So I love that and that, I really just thank you for all your wisdom, your insight, and just the person you are, Paul. I've been really inspired just in the short time I've known you with the way that you are completely embody that radically generous entrepreneur. And again, I encourage anybody out there listening, make sure to go to the website. We'll have it up on the screen and get on the list to get the first copies available of this book. You want to learn how to become radically generous, whether that is in your business, working for somebody, or in your faith, that we are radically generous and being the type of faith that people are attracted to and wanna know about this amazing gift in Christ that we have that is life, or in your business, it's going to benefit you regardless what situation you're in, you're really going to love this book. And so, Paul, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really enjoyed our time together. Thanks so much, Raina. It was great to be here. Wonderful. And th for those of you listening, thank you again for tuning in. And until I see you next time, may the Lord bless and keep you, cause his face to shine upon you, and nourish your soul.